week on Locks Unsolved, we are covering the death of Karen Silkwood, a case unlike any case we've ever seen before. This is personally one of my favorites. 28-year-old Karen Gay Silkwood was an American chemical technician and a laboratory analyst who worked at the Carmagee Simmer and Fuel Fabrication Site near Crescent, Oklahoma, where plutonium pellets were manufactured and distributed to use as reactor fuel in the nuclear power plants. Plutonium is highly radioactive, which is extremely dangerous when inhaled. However, plutonium particles can only travel small distances and cannot penetrate skin. Her specific plant was known to have accounts of workers stealing pounds of plutonium and taking it elsewhere. Ironically, she was an activist on behalf of the health and safety issues at the chemical plants. After protesting these safety issues, she was assigned to investigate health and safety measures of the workplace in the summer of 1974. On November 5th, 1974, Silkwood was carrying out her day grinding and polishing plutonium samples. It's important to note that Silkwood was using protective glove box designed to ensure that the worker would not be contaminated by such harmful chemicals. Directly after taking her hands out of the glove box, she checked her hands for any contamination. After testing positive, she performed a more extensive check on her whole body. The monitoring device revealed evidence of plutonium contamination on her left hand, right wrist, upper arm, neck, hair, and nostrils. Plutonium was also found on the outside part of the glove box, the part that came in contact with her hands, although showing no signs of holes or damage to the gloves, which radiation could have seeped through. It is also important to note that there had been no significant amounts of plutonium in the air and no plutonium found on surfaces in the work area, which means the source of contamination was not coming from the workplace. Wait, what now? So, what are the effects of radiation poisoning? Like, wouldn't she be a little dizzy or something? <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. I could imagine her just like, I work in a chemical plant and I'm dizzy and I feel like dying. Chill. <laughs> That's cool. I'm just going to make a bologna sandwich while I'm at it. That's chill. Ha <laughs> ha, I love death. <laughs> I love fake happiness. Silkwood had finished her cleanup at 9 p.m. and we checked for contamination as a precaution. Silkwood had returned to the laboratory at 1.10 a.m., but did no further work in the glove boxes. She left the plant uncontaminated. The next day, November 6th at 7.30 a.m., she was tested positive for surface contamination on her hands. This is eerie considering that she had only done paperwork that morning and has not come in direct contact with chemicals in the workplace. Once again, she was decontaminated. On November 7th, she was tested for contamination directly upon her arrival to the workplace at 7.50 a.m. Results were positive. High levels of contamination were detected on her hands, arm, chest, neck, and right ear. Moreover, her four urine samples and fecal tests were contaminated as well. No signs of contamination were found in her car. Suspicion arose that there would be contamination outside of the plant. A decontamination squad followed Silkwood to her apartment, where her roommate was also tested positive for radiation, of a lesser degree than Silkwood. The squad continued to test the rest of the apartment, finding that several rooms were also contaminated. The level of contamination in her apartment was so high that many of her personal belongings had been destroyed. When confronted about the amount of plutonium in her apartment, Silkwood had proposed a lieu of explanations as to why there could have been evidence of plutonium, none of which explained why they were on her person in the first place. From there, Silkwood was sent to the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory to determine the extent of contamination in her vital organs, where they found radioactive material in her lungs. The doctor assured her that there have been patients with much more radiation in their bodies, and that she would be unlikely to suffer from lung cancer due to radiation poisoning. I love how the doctor's just not concerned about literally anything else. Like, oh, you don't have lung cancer. That's fine. Just leave. Like, doc, I still don't feel good. Like. Shouldn't you check that? So, are you gonna give me ibuprofen or...? <laughs> Someone just comes in frothing at the mouth and is like dying from radiation poisoning. The doctor's just like, here, Advil. It's the Advil conspiracy. <laughs> the Advil conspiracy. Silkwood returned to work on November 12th. She was restricted from doing any radiation work. After work that night, she went to a union meeting in Crescent, Oklahoma. The meeting ended at 7 p.m. when she left alone in her car. Over an hour later, at 8.05 p.m., the Oklahoma State Highway Patrol was informed of a single car accident seven miles south of Crescent. 
that night, Silkwood was found dead in her automobile, which was wrecked to the point that the entire front was compressed, indicating a collision with a large flat object. An Oklahoma state trooper reported the accident as a one-car sleeping driver accident. An autopsy held on November 14, 1974 on Silkwood's body showed that her blood contained almost twice the amount of methaquilone, a sedative, that was required for inducing drowsiness. There had also been about 50 milligrams of undissolved methaquilone in her stomach and tested positive for plutonium radiation poisoning. Parts of her body were given to laboratories where they were tested for research on Silkwood's story and effects of radiation. And with that, let's get into some theories. The highway scout that helped find Silkwood's body on the Highway 74, seven miles from the plant, says he noticed multiple documents scattered in the mud and tossed them in the back of her wrecked Honda. However, by the time Wadka, Steffens, and Burnham retrieved their car from the garage the next day, the manila folder with the documents were gone. Since an autopsy showed traces of alcohol and a sedative in her bloodstreams and in her digestive system, the Oklahoma Highway Patrol concluded that Silkwood had fallen asleep while driving and drifted off the road to her death. When the OCAW learned of the missing folder, they hired auto accident specialist A.O. Pipkin a former Albuquerque policeman to check for foul play. On November 19th, Pipkin announced that he had found quite substantial evidence, a fresh dent in the Honda's rear bumper, inconsistencies with the highway's contour, and skid marks at the scene. Oh, skid marks. What, what, what's wrong with that? I mean, of course there were skid marks It drove off the freaking road. But they were deep. They wouldn't have been there if she didn't, like, step really hard on the brakes. And? How could she have stepped so hard on the brakes if she was asleep? The plot thickens. No, no, the plot doesn't thicken. I mean, if I was asleep at the wheel, it wouldn't be that hard to step on the brakes, right? <laughs> how the hell would you know how it's like to be asleep at the wheel? It, it's just hypothetical. <laughs> to hell with your skepticism. Let's get back to the theory. That indicated that someone had hit and run her car, causing her car to drift off course. Reading later claimed that Care McGee needed the documents for a lawsuit, and the company expected to be filed on the behalf of Silkwood. Kerr McGee did not want Silkwood's death to be turned against the company, but that did not explain why the company should worry about a lawsuit, assuming it had no complicity in Silkwood's death. A year and a half later, Jack Sroji, a journalist from Nashville, gave an answer. The key to the mystery, she said, was in the missing manila folder. Silkwood must have unknowingly collected documents that would have uncovered a nuclear smuggling ring at the plants, Roji said. The smugglers must have poisoned Silkwood with plutonium to scare her and to keep her quarantined, away from the Care McGee files. And when Silkwood bravely returned to the plant, they ran her off the road and took the folder. Karen Silkwood must have had figures in her possession which not only pinpointed the exact amount of nuclear material missing, but the persons involved as well, Sroji said. She didn't know the time bomb she was carrying. Less popular conspiracy is that Silkwood had been taking the plutonium and selling it to outside companies in order to get extra money and sabotage the company. Could this have been an inside job with the sole purpose of ruining the company? Could a death have been a sacrifice made in order to draw attention to the flaws of the working conditions? Recall that pounds of plutonium had been reported missing from the company and were not found in her apartment nor her car. This would explain why she would be contaminated when coming to work but not have any physical plutonium on her person. It was also theorized that her roommate was an accomplice. This would explain how she was able to keep quiet about the situation but still have a significant amount of radiation poisoning on her body. Could there have been more ladies who accompanied them in the outside sale of plutonium products? Some say that the skid marks on the road were purposefully made to make it look like an accident and not a self-inflicted accident. This, however, does not explain the substantial amount of sedatives in her digestive system. An even weirder theory is that Silkwood's allegations about the company should be disqualified because she was bisexual. Quote, lesbies don't care, they'll do anything. End quote. Lesbies? <laughs> well, like, okay, it's like, oh, I get it. I, I solved the case, guys. She's gay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she's gay. The police is like, correlation. <laughs> she's gay, and that's why she yeah. died. Yeah. <laughs> 
With thousands of conspiracy theories and several Supreme Court cases, none of them really seemed to match up with what had happened, making this case truly unique and strange. Still, Karen Silkwood remains as one of the most important whistleblowers in our society, affecting millions of workers worldwide. Her impact is undeniable, but whether or not she's a hero or criminal remains unsolved.